Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today I'm going to be talking about UFO healing cases. And in fact, the title of this episode is called 10 Shocking Cases of UFO Healings. As you may know, I have done a lot of research into these types of cases. I think they have quite a bit to say about extraterrestrials, how advanced they are and their agenda on our planet. And these cases here are particularly unusual. They cover a wide variety of healings, conditions. And as I said, I think they really have some really profound insights into extraterrestrials and why they're here. These cases come from all over the world. They've occurred to all kinds of people. Most major researchers have these types of cases and they're just not receiving the attention they deserve. They show that UFO contact is often very benevolent. So that's why I really wanted to do this episode for you today. And as I mentioned, these cases are quite unusual. I have 10 of them, and I think you'll find them quite interesting. I certainly hope so. So let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk about today occurred in Marysville, Washington. I call the main witness Marla. That's a pseudonym but she had a very interesting healing involving her gallbladder. Now Marla and her family had been seeing UFOs many times outside their home in Marysville, but it was in January of 2015 when Marla had gone to bed and heard someone banging around in the kitchen. She assumed her oldest daughter was cooking and thought nothing of it, but as she lay back down, events became very strange. As Marla says in her own words, suddenly, I heard a loud, high-pitched ring. It was disorienting. My bedroom door opened, and I saw three beings walk into my room. I couldn't make out what they looked like. Light bathed behind them, so they looked dark, and it was hard to make out the detail. Marla says that these figures were short, stout, with large heads and a short neck. And as she says, as soon as I saw them, I sat up and tried to speak, they walked to the foot of my bed, and then one touched my foot, and bam, I was out like a light. Now this case was researched by a MUFON field investigator by the name of Mark Krubsack. He's also the state section director for California, so it's a well-verified case. At any rate, Marla woke up the next morning to one of the most shocking sights of her life. She worked in the medical field, she was familiar with surgery and surgical procedures. At the time of her visitation, she was suffering from kidney disease and gallstones. She was, in fact, due to have surgery to remove her gallbladder in one week. And as Marla says, the next day, the very moment I woke up, I exhaled what tasted like gas. It was a familiar f feeling and tasted like I had just woken up from surgery and had been put to sleep with an anesthesia. I was groggy, so I tried to sit up in bed and felt a sharp pain in my abdominal area. I looked under my shirt, and I indeed had an incision. This was like no incision I had seen before. First, it was very straight, as an arrow, and was very clean. The skin looked void of blood at the incision, and second, no betadine or other substances were used to prep a patient's skin to prevent infection. Third, it was glued together, no stitches or staples. Not only did it not have any dried blood or cautery marks, but most of all, the odd thing was it could be pulled apart and still no blood. And when you let go, it sealed right back together until you pulled it apart again. So understandably, Marla freaked out she opened the incision two inches deep, but became frightened and closed it back up again. She showed it to her family, who were equally baffled and alarmed. And at the time of the incident, everyone had been in bed, though a few of them had also heard the strange banging in the kitchen. And when they inspected the kitchen, there was nothing disturbed. So Marla told nobody but her family what happened, and as she says, as someone who worked in nursing and surgery for years, I knew I couldn't talk to my doctor about it without being labeled crazy. And the surprises were still coming. As Marla says in her own words, 
A few days after this happened, the incision rapidly healed, far faster than any I have had before. Most of the time, my incisions took well over a month to heal due to my bad kidney disease. Now, it was one week before this incident that Marla was scheduled to have another pre-surgery ultrasound and exam for her gallbladder removal surgery, and by this time, the mysterious incision on her abdomen was gone. She went to the doctors to get her ultrasound, and this is when she got a huge surprise. As Marla says in her own words, when they did the ultrasound, the stone that was as large as my gallbladder was completely gone. The stone I had was far too large for me to pass, and it had to be removed along with my gallbladder. But when I got the ultrasound, the stone was gone, yet my gallbladder remained. This baffled the doctors. A gallstone surgery has to include removing the gallbladder, yet mine was intact, sans stone. So Marla has no idea why this happened to her, and unfortunately, the ultimate results were not good, because one year following the incident, she had a new and larger gallstone and had to have it surgically removed. So while she believes the ETs healed her, it was only temporary. And as Marla says, she wasn't happy about this. As she says, this event changed my life in a bad way. Even though I am thankful to whoever helped heal my body from a bad stone, it scares me that I have no idea who it was or why they took me to do such a thing. This has made me fear who could remove me from my home, perform a surgery on me, and put me back without anyone being the wiser. Also, to not know who did this to me, our own government or some non-human, has made it quite hard on me. I want answers, yet have no way to ever find out who did this. So she began suffering from anxieties and was afraid to reach out to support from the medical community for fear of being labeled deluded. Luckily, her family was very supportive. Then, a few months later, in the summer of 2015, it happened again. And on this occasion, Marla woke up to find a clean, precise surgical scar across her sternum area. And as before, it healed very rapidly. As Marla says, I still have both scars. I need answers. But most of all, I want people to know that life is not exactly what we think it is when someone else can remove you from your home and you have no memory of what happened, no power to stop it. It's scary. Yet I know people need to know it does happen. So Marla finally did reach out to MUFON to report her experience, and as she says, I am willing to provide medical records and proof of my gallstone being there and disappearing. I also would do a polygraph to prove that I am being honest. So yeah, I agree with her. This is something that people do need to know about. It's an interesting case because this is the kind of surgery that we can't do, and yet the ETs did it. And it's also interesting because the cure wasn't permanent. Uh, it's an interesting case on many levels. And here's another case which is very interesting involving a cure for cancer. This occurred in the city of Aguada. This is in northwest Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has a huge number of encounters. And the main witness in this case is Maria M. Rivera. Her case has been reported in a number of cases. She's been quite vocal about it. Starting in 2005, Maria and her family, who are all devout Christians, were repeatedly visited by gray ETs in their home in Aguada. The first encounter that they're aware of occurred on November 10, 2005, when she and her daughter saw a huge silver disc with portholes move over the house and apparently descend into the rainforest behind their home. It was just a few months later, on April 28, 2006, Maria was in the backyard when her dog suddenly became paralyzed and a gray ET emerged from the forest and began to communicate with her telepathically. And at this point, the entire family experienced a period of missing time. So following this encounter, the visitations began to occur every couple of months or so, usually involving greys outside or inside their home, 
when she saw a gray peering in through the front door window. So after a half dozen or more of these visitations, Maria experienced a full-blown onboard experience. On November 3rd, 2007, she woke up to find her bed surrounded by gray ETs. She was rendered unconscious, but woke up shortly later to find herself in a strange room, lying on what she believes is a steel or metallic table, still surrounded by the grays. She was unable to move as the ETs placed a round, metallic, suction cup-like instrument on her abdomen. And as Maria says, It felt as if my flesh was being stretched, and my inside was being sucked out like a powerful vacuum. I was in excruciating pain when they did that, but I was unable to scream or move. Now, at this time, Maria was actually suffering from ovarian cancer, which had spread throughout her body. She had undergone operations in New York City to have these malignancies removed from her intestines and her breast, but the cancer kept returning, and currently she was suffering from constant stomach pains and had traces of blood in her stool and urine, and her doctors had tested her and told her that the cancer had spread again and that she needed another operation. So this was when this encounter occurred. And as Maria says, in her own words, after the encounter with these creatures on April 28, 2006, I returned to New York. Several tests were performed and no cancer was detected. The pain and bleeding had stopped. I truly feel that these creatures cured me. Now, despite her cure, Maria was not quite ready to embrace the greys. As she says, they could be benevolent and compassionate creatures, but I'm afraid of them. They do not have my permission to do with my body whatever they please. Although I believe they had cured me, I am not their guinea pig. I think it is fair to say that those beings have tagged, branded, and are actively tracking abductees like myself. They're quite awful creatures and have no regard for humanity and animals living on Earth. To them, we're just a science project. I could be wrong, but I think the creatures cured my cancer because they need a healthy specimen for their experiments. So this just goes to show how deeply afraid people are. And even though these ETs are curing people and doing a wonderful service, people don't always <laughs> react in ways you would think. Uh, Maria says that during her operation in which she was healed, she managed to communicate briefly with the ETs and called them Martians. They informed her that they don't like to be called Martians and preferred to be called creatures. So this is an interesting case. Uh, yes, she did feel pain during this operation, which is true for a lot of the cancer cures that I've covered in other cases. Uh, but they healed her where doctors couldn't. And I understand, you know, people are free to have their own interpretations to what's going on here. Uh, but they did heal her, and she is thankful. She just has a lot of fear surrounding this. And this is one of the reasons I want to do these episodes to inform people because fear really just comes from the unknown. Now here's another case involving a cure of jaundice and this occurred in Johannesburg, South Africa on July 1988. Diane and her daughter Phyllis, who was 34 years old, were driving to their home in Johannesburg when a bright light descended over their car. They felt a presence, and suddenly they saw a five-foot-tall woman with a tan complexion. So the woman guided them into a craft and introduced herself as Melila, that's her name, and said that she meant no harm. Next thing Diane and Phyllis know, they find themselves completely trusting, and they allowed Melila to put them on a table for medical examination and tests. And they said there were several other people in the craft. At some point, Phyllis, the daughter, heard her mother gasp in pain during the exam, and she said, you're not doing that to me. And Malila replied, if there's trouble, 
we can't help you unless you allow it. So at the time of this incident, Diane, the mother, was suffering from hemolytic jaundice. And the being asked her, what do your medical people call your condition? And Diane told the ETs about her jaundice, which she had had chronically since age 12. So they apparently did a healing. And they not only healed her, they gave her many prophecies about disasters that would affect the entire world in the future. And this case was investigated by renowned researcher Cynthia Hind. And as Cynthia Hind writes, since the abduction, her illness has apparently cleared up and she has never needed medical attention since. She has been absolutely well. Prior to that, nobody had been able to find a cure for her condition. So yeah, overall, a very benevolent encounter, and once again, we see ETs healing conditions that Earth doctors simply cannot do. And here's another example of this same sort of thing. This next case occurred in 1986 to a gentleman from La Jolla, California. And this case was investigated by researcher Brad Steiger. The main witness, we only know his first name, Richard, and the first initial of his last name, which is T. So the main witness, Richard T, was actually wheelchair bound. He's partially paralyzed. And one evening while enjoying uh, an evening on the beach, Richard was shocked to see a 100 foot long torpedo shaped object, a craft, hovering above him. And the next thing he knew, he was falling into a kind of trance and felt himself being lifted up into the craft while still in his wheelchair. He says he had no fear as he was examined by, quote, smallish humanoids with large heads and enormously large slanted eyes. So he doesn't have a whole lot of recall of what happened, but the next thing he knew, he found himself seated in the front seat of his van with his wheelchair tucked away in the back. And the most fantastic part of this whole experience, the most shocking part, was of course the after effect. Because according to Brad Steiger, and I quote, Amazingly, over the next few weeks, his condition began to reverse itself until he was finally able to walk again with the help of a cane. So yeah, there you go. The ETs cured a gentleman of paralysis. It's amazing what they can do. And here is another really good example of their amazing abilities to heal. This next case occurred in St. Eustache, Quebec. And this occurred on August 30th, 1979, to a retired Canadian Army officer by the name of Jean Sear. Now, this case was investigated by well-known researcher Wendell Stevens. And how this case began was the family was drawn outside by a strange humming noise. And once outside... They saw a large glowing metallic disc rise from the fields behind their house, hover over their home, and send down beams of light. So they lived not far from the Mirabel Airport, the Montreal Airport. So they called the nearby Mirabel Control Tower in the Montreal International Airport, who confirmed to him that they could actually see the UFO. So this is great confirmation. And in fact, the tower controller vectored in a plane. But the UFO winked out as soon as the plane came close and came back when the plane left. And another attempt provoked the same response. And meanwhile, the neighbors of the Sears also saw this object and called the police. And five hours later, the UFO left and they found strange circular marks in the fields where this object had apparently landed. So this is a lot of confirmation. Mr. Sear and his family were extensively interviewed by various UFO groups. Meanwhile, over the next few weeks, they began to have more sightings. And during one sighting, 
this object was again observed hovering very low over their house. And in fact, uh, Gene Sear was able to get an audio recording of the UFO. Also, many other people in the area reported seeing this object. So this case has many fascinating aspects, but important here is the apparent cure, because at the time, Gene Sear was suffering badly from multiple sclerosis, and in fact, had to go to the hospital for treatment every two weeks. He was virtually paralyzed from the disease. He spent most of his time in a wheelchair. However, following this series of encounters, he began to notice strange marks on his body that he couldn't explain, so it was clear that he was having personal experiences, and nor could he explain something else. His multiple sclerosis disappeared. It was suddenly cured, and as Wendell Stevens writes, all symptoms of the disease have gone, and he hasn't had a stroke since. It's amazing. And here's another really shocking case. I love this case because it's one of the earliest on record. It occurred in the mid-1930s. And this case comes from a journalist and UFO researcher by the name of Sarah Overstreet. She does not give the gentleman's name because apparently he's quite well known. He's a famous broadcaster. And he says that he contracted tuberculosis when he was 13 years old. This is apparently in the Missouri area. At that time, of course, there were no such things as vaccinations or inoculations or even antibiotics. And diseases like tu tuberculosis could not be controlled. And as the broadcaster says, I got sicker and sicker, and the doctors thought I would die. So he's pretty much on his deathbed when he has this, quote, dream, in which he was taken on board a spacecraft and cured of his disease. And as he says in his own words, in the dream, which he puts in quotes, he says, a spaceship took me aboard and placed me on a table within a glass bubble. The creatures did medical procedures on me, and I was made to understand that now I would be well, and for that the rest of my life I would be healthier and stronger than normal humans. And when the doctors saw me a few days after the dream, they found no trace of the tuberculosis. So at the time, he really didn't know about ETs and UFOs, so he was skeptical. He didn't know quite how to interpret this. In fact, those, the, in those days, there were really no stories about ETs. And it wouldn't be until decades later, really, until the 1950s, when such stories began to be reported in the media, and he realized what had happened to him. As he says, I began to hear other people recount incidents of being taken on board alien craft, and their descriptions are much the same as mine, right down to the way the creatures looked. And incidentally, he says that in the late 1980s, he was in his car when it was hit by a train, totally destroying it, he was, of course, inside the car at the time and didn't receive a scratch. And it is his firm belief that the ETs once again saved his life. And reportedly, the railroad investigators also believe that the accident should have been fatal. So yeah, that's an amazing case for a number of different reasons. I wonder why they healed him, perhaps because he was doing good work as a broadcaster. Hard to say, but it's also interesting that he had this follow-up incident with the train. Yeah, definitely an interesting case. Um, and here is another that is equally interesting. And this case was investigated by researcher Jorge Martin, and it's quite unusual. The main witness is a flight attendant by the name of Carmina, I do believe that is a pseudonym. However, either way, on March 27, 1977, Carmina was involved in the world's most deadly aviation accident on record. This occurred at Tenerife on the Canary Islands, and more than 583 people 
were killed when two jets collided on the runway, and Carmina was one of few miraculous survivors. So that was an unusual experience, uh, and Carmina was soon to find herself the recipient of an equally astonishing experience. It was 20 years later, in March of 1997, when Carmina, who is, was now or then a clinical psychologist, she was working as an insurance broker specializing in medical malpractice cases. And she was working alone in her office in a tall building in downtown San Juan in Puerto Rico. This was a secure building. So Carmina was startled when somebody knocked on her door. And she was surprised to see a strange, smartly dressed man. He, he looked a little different. He was over six feet tall. He had a very tanned complexion and brown hair. And he looked normal enough except for a few weird details. As Carmina says, he had extra, extraordinarily long fingers and had no apparent body hair. And his eyes were extremely large and lilac colored. So she was somewhat stunned by his appearance. And she became even more shocked when the man began to speak about her daughter who was a TV reporter doing a special on UFOs. And this man said that he had come to deliver a message that Carmina should tell her daughter to continue her investigations and that UFO researcher Jorge Martin, who Carmina's daughter was working with, was being observed by American intelligence officers. The man then revealed many true details about Carmina's life that he should not be able to know. So it was clear there was something very profound going on. Carmina listened to this man as he spoke about other subjects. She then asked him about himself and his background, and he was very evasive. But as Carmina says, it seemed to me he wasn't human, and he implied that he himself was an alien collaborating with the U.S. government. So there's definitely some questions there. But finally, the man finished speaking, and he walked from her office. And she was baffled because he seemed to disappear. He didn't take the elevator. The stairs were guarded by security personnel. Everyone had to sign in and out. But her nameless visitor had somehow vanished. Now, this case was also covered by Timothy Good, a very prominent researcher. And as he writes, whatever his origin and nature, Carmina's office visitor seemed to have been a benefit to her. At the time of her encounter, she had a large cyst on her left breast. Later, x-rays showed no sign of it. So that's bizarre. <laughs> and uh, not sure how that happened, but she attributes it to this visitor. Very interesting. And here is yet another shocking case. Just got a few more I'd like to cover. And this one occurred in New Jersey, Atlantic City, New Jersey, to a gentleman by the name of Richard Rilke. Richard Rilke has had UFO contacts his whole life. In fact, he's had a number of healings. I'll just cover one here. It was in the mid-1980s when Richard developed a tumor on the right side of his forehead, and he was told by doctors that his tumor was related to a leukemia-type condition from his childhood. And in fact, he'd already had several benign tumors surgically removed from his body, yet the tumors kept returning. And Richard Rilke, his ET contacts were human-looking, and they advised him not to have any more surgery. However, these tumors kept reappearing, so Richard was forced to have another operation. And it was during his stay at a convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, that Richard Rilke's alien friends, who are, we have their names, Koran and Nepos, they appeared and actually removed one particularly bothersome tumor, leaving no traces of it. And that seemed to solve the problem until years later, when another a tumor appeared on Richard's forehead. And this one grew quickly. It, 
it soon became inches wide and was showing no signs of healing. And Richard's friends and family began to express concern about it, that it was affecting his health. And of course, by, Richard himself was concerned. And by 1989, it was quite prominent. And then, on July 5, 1989, Richard says he rece received a house visit by one of his human-looking E.T. friends. They told him that they were aware of this tumor and had been searching for a method to remove it. They took him on board a craft and told him they were going to test a new healing device on him. They placed a small handheld instrument that emitted a beam of light. Richard was placed in an unconscious state and he says he felt no physical sensation at all. And when he awoke, the aliens told him that his tumor was gone and he was instantly, quote, beamed back into his bedroom. So as soon as he found himself back in the house, he dashed to the mirror and saw that the ETs were right. His tumor was gone. So what's interesting about this case is that he, Richard knew a lot of people, and he says that nearly a hundred people had seen this tumor. So when it disappeared, it amazed all of them, and they all verified the cure. Richard states that many of the people that he knew were very much surprised, making comments like, my God, they're not all bad, are they? Uh, no, of course they're not. <laughs> um, they're healing a lot of people, far more than the cases uh, that we know about, I think. And here's another really amazing case. This one I like because it occurred to a lady by the name of Faina Maximovna, and this is in Simferopol, Crimea in Ukraine. So this was in 1979 and Faina was suffering from a painful inflammation of her thyroid which was caused by an apparent tumor. She was seriously ill and her doctors had scheduled her for surgery but she was afraid of undergoing surgery and was really worried that she might not survive it. And it was one evening, shortly before her scheduled surgery, that she decided to pray to God to save her. And after praying, she fell asleep. Now this case was reported by Albert Rosales in his excellent multi-volume series, Humanoids Among Us. And it was in the middle of the night when Fena was woken up by a bright light hovering right outside her balcony. She looked outside and saw a disc-shaped object covered with colored lights. Suddenly an opening in the disc appeared. A ladder-like device came down, followed by three very tall, human-looking figures dressed in shimmery silver suits. And using telepathy, the being spoke to her. They said, you will not be operated on. We will cure you without surgery. Fina says that one of them held a large bottle filled with red liquid. A thin hose was connected to the neck of the bottle, and one of the beings placed the other end of the hose on her neck. She says she felt a little sting and fell asleep. And the next morning she woke up, and it was her mother actually who noticed a mark on her daughter's neck and actually woke her up. And this is when... Fena discovered that her swelling and pain were gone. She went to Kiev to visit her doctors, who were very much surprised and confused because medical tests showed that her thyroid tumor had apparently dissolved. And following this incident, she continued to enjoy excellent health all the way into old age. And as Alberto Rosales writes, Apparently, the mysterious guests not only cured Fena, but awarded her with very strong immunity. In 2004, she was 80 years of age and looked 20 years younger. So I like this case for a number of reasons. Uh, she reports that her healing occurred right before surgery. That's a pattern we do see a lot. What's also interesting is she asked for a healing and received it, 
and also enjoyed excellent health for many years afterwards. This is a pattern we see in a lot of cases. And now just one final case I'd like to share, which I think is really interesting. And this occurred in, at a truck stop in Mississippi. It's undisclosed. This case does come from Brad Steiger. And this occurred at 4 a.m. on December 15, 1989, to a waitress. Her name is May. She was about 60 years old and was heading home from her truck stop, from the truck stop, when a bright light hovered over her car. And the next thing she knows, it's 6 a.m. She found herself waking up with her car parked alongside the road. And she had flashbacks, memories of being in a strange, quote, doctor's examining room. And in fact, she remembered several figures standing around her while a, quote, doctor stood next to her and, as she says, passed some kind of rod over my body again and again. So this really perplexed her, and she was even more shocked by the after effects. Because at this time, she was suffering from severe arthritis. She had for several years. And in fact, her condition had recently worsened to the point that she was about to retire despite having no benefits. She says the arthritis was present in her wrist, knee, and finger joints. But after this encounter, she discovered that her arthritis was completely gone. She felt no pain and it allowed her to continue her employment. It's, it's an interesting case. Why would ETs cure a 60-year-old waitress? Uh, apparently it was out of altruistic you know, reasons. Certainly that's what the witness feels like. There you go. Those are the 10 cases I wanted to cover for you today. They do all appear in my book. The Healing Power of UFOs, 300 True Accounts of People Healed by Extraterrestrials. And I think you'll agree that they do show how truly advanced ETs are with their ability to heal what we consider to be chronic conditions, uh, diseases and conditions that we simply cannot heal. Um, we can treat them, but we cannot cure them. Uh, and it also shows that they are people very much like us. They're not always perfect. And it shows how people can react to healings in many different ways. So yeah, these cases do have a lot to say about the UFO phenomenon. And that's, again, why I really wanted to report on these cases. hope you've enjoyed this episode today. I really appreciate you watching. And there's always more to learn about UFOs. So thanks once again, and until next time, keep looking for answers, keep searching for the truth, and most important, keep having fun. Bye now.